I'll try not to give a real introduction into quantum computing because um, that by itself will take more than an hour. And I really want to focus on why quantum computing is relevant for existing and new developers. And um, I don't think there's another way to, um, uh, to start than uh, by comparing quantum computing with classical uh, computing. So in classical computing, we have the concept of a bit. A classical bit is uh, either zero or one. And everything in uh, classic computing is based around this concept of bits. We can do operations on bits and we can concat them in, in, in a byte and we can have a string, which is basically a combination of bytes. We can do um, uh, arithmetic, we can do operations on bytes. In the end, it all comes down on simple operations, gates applied to uh, bits. And for example, um, probably the simplest uh, uh, operation that you can think of is the, uh, the not uh, operation. And a not applied to zero uh, returns one. In Java, for example, you can um, see this concept by um, having a Boolean that we assign the initial value of false. And then a second Boolean uh, bar is um, the uh, negation of uh, 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 the first Boolean. So that will then be uh, true. So that is, that is very simple how classic computing is uh, uh, working. We have simple bits. In um, quantum computing, um, we have also bits, but we call them qubits. They're uh, sort of um, the equivalent, equivalent of quantum uh, uh, bits. And similar to classic computing, the operations in quantum computing are done on one or more qubits. Before we are uh, going into more detail about what a qubit is, let's have a look at um, uh, a game in Java. So. I will now start the Mary Had a Little Qubit um, uh, game, and we will show some of the code. So this is again uh, Mary walking around there. She can still go to the barn, but when she goes there, um, she will get only one sheep at a time, just to make things uh, uh, easier. And um, I changed the the sprites, or at least the the meaning of the the different parts in this game. For example. Um, you see at the bottom right that you can press X, H, or C to activate or deactivate gates. These gates are quantum gates. So it's the equivalent of quantum computing, uh, of uh, classical gates, but then applied to quantum computing. For example, when I press the X, you see that the chicken coop is now highlighted. If I press X again, it's uh, disabled. And if I press X again, it's enabled again. So this gate is now active. If Mary uh, walks with the lamp through that gate, you will see that that lamp will change. It's now uh, black and not white anymore. And at the top of the screen, you can see um, a quantum circuit. Um, you don't need to know um, anything about that circuit right now. Just be aware of that Mary is now walking with a qubit. So that, that is a bit. It used to be zero, which is white. And now it is one. If Mary goes to the church, you see that the value at the church is currently zero. She comes there with a qubit that was in the state uh, one. So the total value that's now in the church is one. And we can create a string of uh, um, two qubits, for example. And if we go with those two lamp qubits to the chicken coop, they will uh, both become one. So we now have the representation of one, one in, in, in binary, one, one is the three in decimal. So if Mary goes to the um, church again, the number of our qubit string is uh, read and added to the church. So one plus three is four. So that is uh, um, so far um, uh, nothing special. That's just, um, that looks like uh, classical computing. The only thing is we do it with qubits instead of bits. But so far there is um, no difference. Let's go back to the slides. So the qubit that we showed until now 
is 0 or 1, similar to the classical bit. But the qubit can also be a combination of 0 and 1. And that sounds strange. So, so, so how can something be a combination uh, between uh, a combination of zero and one? That is um, counterintuitive. It should be either zero or one. As you could see in the game, the the lamp was either black or white, but not gray. So, how can this be possible with uh, qubits? Now, before we answer that question, let's first think about what is actually um, a bit and what is a classical bit. And in um, classic computing, a classical bit is um, zero when there's no current allowed or one when there's current flowing through a transistor. So there is a physical component that determines whether um, a bit is zero or one. So there's a direct analogy between the hardware world and the software world. And that is actually um, the same in uh, quantum computing. There is a direct relation between a physical representation of a qubit and the software representation of our uh, qubit. So um, we'll first um, mention the a number of possibilities that allow to create a physical qubit. And then I will show how it's represented in software. So. Physically, a qubit can be um, a superconducting circuit, or a photon, or a trapped ion, or an electron with a, with a spin. And those representations are concepts that are um, uh, come from quantum physics that uh, are known to be um, uh, that can be in a superposition, in a combination of two different states. And what is this? Um, without going into um, into a physical detail. Um, let's take a simple example well, simple, um, of an electron. And you may have heard that an electron has a property which is called a spin. And uh, the spin can be uh, up or down. And it's, uh, um, it's related to how the electron is uh, uh, moving. And uh, in a, sp a spin up corresponds, for example, with the number one. And a spin down corresponds with the number zero. So if the electron is in spin up, that is actually sort of a qubit with a value one. And if an electron is in spin down, that is then a qubit in, um, uh, with value uh, zero. But the spin can, uh, the electron uh, state can be in a combination of spin up and spin down. And that um, means that until we measure the value of the spin, there's a chance that we will measure spin up and there's a chance that we will measure spin down. And this is really one of the core concepts of quantum physics. This is not, uh, this does not mean that um, it's either spin up or spin down and we simply don't know it yet. No, it's uh, proven that this is um, really a combination of two spins. And um, I have to be careful about the wording because some people are very um, uh, picky about uh, how you call this, but um, sometimes it's said that this electron has spin up and spin down at the same moment. Um, there's discussion about whether you should use that term or not, but I often think that for developers, um, you don't need to worry too much about the physical background. So um, if you want to think about it, that this electron is spin, has spin up and spin down at the same moment, then I, I think that's, that, that, that's fine. But the, the terminology that we're using for this is that um, this, is, this is in a superposition state. A superposition means that um, we have a combination of two base states here. So it's one and zero at the same moment. Maybe there's, at, at this uh, uh, picture, for example, you can see that there the, the arrow going up is larger than the arrow going down. So maybe if we measure it, we might have maybe 70% chance to measure one and 30% chance to measure zero. But until we measure it, it's uh, both. So there are a number of um, different possibilities. Um, for representing a qubit in hardware, um, trapped ions, electron with a spin, uh, superconducting circuit, for example, with uh, Josephson junctions. 
In the software world, we simply call that a qubit. And um, I'm very glad to be in the software because um, I, I, um, I really think that the, the hardware is really the uh, amazing uh, part because realizing quantum hardware um, is extremely difficult. And in software, we can make abstraction of this. We simply assume that it's there and it's up to the hardware engineers to, um, well, to bring it there, but that's an uh, incredible uh, achievement that they are uh, doing. So um, what is the current state of uh, 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 quantum software? Well, you can't buy a quantum computer from Dell uh, at the moment, or you can't go to a radio shack or and, and, and buy a quantum uh, mobile device or so. so. So those quantum computers are not widely available. There are some prototypes, there are some commercial uh, implementations uh, for dedicated usage or more general usage. For example, companies like IBM, Rigetti, D-Wave, they have those and they provide access uh, to those quantum computers. Um, and often this access is provided via the cloud. So you can subscribe to a cloud service and then you send an application to the cloud and that's then executed on um, one of the uh, quantum computers in the cloud. That is not very uh, easy for developers. Um, if you um, have to test your application by um, sending the execution request to a cloud service where you have to wait until one is available. And so that, that's, uh, um, that doesn't really scale. It, uh, um, um, it reminds me of uh, uh, when I uh, was a student that we had a, a mainframe and you could uh, write your program and then submit it to the mainframe and, um, and wait for the result to come back the next day or so. Um, the good thing about that was that you were forced to think very hard about your um, application because um, if the debug cycle takes one day, you have to think uh, very hard about uh, uh, before you submit a request. But fortunately, the situation now is different because you don't need to, um, to use a real quantum computer to write and test quantum software because the quantum hardware can be simulated in software. Um, there are some um, restrictions because the software uh, simulation is much slower than the real hardware, but that's typically okay because the most of the work that's currently being done with quantum computing is uh, related to experiments and, uh, and trying to find out which algorithms would be uh, really beneficial for uh, quantum uh, computing. So it also allows you to program in a more higher level language like Java or Python, for example, uh, instead of going low level and talk about the uh, quantum algorithm, quantum uh, gates, uh, which are more complex. It's, it's a bit like um, in classical computing, you program in a high level language and not really in machine language. So um, one of the um, quantum software simulators uh, that you can use is Strange, which is a quantum computing simulator written in Java, um, where I'm the, uh, the lead developer for. And it contains uh, of actually two layers. So the top layer um, provides quantum APIs uh, at a high level, um, and they are accessible to Java developers uh, and you don't need to know much about quantum computing. It's just that they will internally use lower level quantum um, properties and quantum algorithms to achieve the result. And that lower level is then um, uh, also accessible uh, for developers. So if you want to use that lower level, you can, you can do that by programming uh, to the lower level APIs. And uh, with Strange, you can currently execute your applications um, on your own local host, on your own laptop or desktop. And you can also, um, and that's what uh, I'm working on right now, use a cloud-based simulator. Um, one of the reasons for this is that, um, as I said, a quantum simulator is slower, requires more memory. So for bigger tasks, it's often beneficial to offload them uh, to a cloud. So um, 
comparing the um, high-level APIs and the low-level APIs, um, the high-level API is, uh, uh, well, one of the examples is um, a function called random bit, and that will give you a random bit. So that doesn't sound very useful, but it's, uh, it's very good to, uh, as an introduction into quantum computing. And the, the key point here is that um, we only use uh, Java types here. So uh, this function has no uh, parameter, but it returns an int, which is known to Java developers. Another function that's part of this high level quantum APIs is a search uh, function where you provide a list of elements that you want to search into, and then a function um, that um, returns uh, the uh, element that you're actually uh, be searching for. This is uh, an implementation of a Grover's algorithm, which allows for searching uh, a list uh, leveraging quantum uh, uh, properties, uh, which will make it much faster than if you would have to iterate over all the uh, elements in a, uh, doing it in a classical way. But you don't need to know anything about how it is actually done because everything that you see here, these um, parameters that are uh, passed to the function are purely Java parameters, existing parameters. So a list, a function, an integer, that's all standard Java. So you don't need to know anything about quantum computing if you um, want to leverage quantum computing. However, it helps and it's fun. Um, the main reason why it helps is um, it's 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 good to to understand why uh, some algorithms uh, are applicable to quantum computing and why others are less applicable. And at a low level, API in Strange is using uh, gates like the Hallamar gate. I will come to that immediately, or the X gate, which is the 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 not gate, or the conditional not gate, and that uses quantum types. And if you want to use this. Uh, API, then you need to know uh, what you're doing. Strange, so that quantum simulator is an open source uh, uh, project. You can go to GitHub, uh, Redifex Quantum Strange, and you can find the source code there. And it contains some uh, uh, information uh, about how to build it, if you would like to build it, and how to run some uh, samples. So, well, maybe. Um, I can show the website. So this is uh, strange. It explains how you can get started with a very simple program. So this is how you can uh, use uh, strange. This is a simple Java application. You can create a, a program, a quantum program, add some uh, steps and add some uh, gates to those steps and then execute the program and measure the result. So this is using the low level uh, quantum APIs. I will at least show the high level uh, quantum APIs as well. Well, actually I can show them right now. Um, I open uh, uh, NetBeans and um, there you see the, um, the code of uh, Strange. So this is the, uh, the Strange uh, project loaded in my IDE. And there's a call uh, a class classic, which provides some of the high level APIs. And um, so the uh, method that I showed on the slide is the random bit method. It returns an int, it returns a random number. So that's actually the first um, use case that I describe in the book. Um, how can you return a random integer in uh, uh, Java uh, with quantum computing? That sounds totally uh, unuseful, but actually it's not because this is really, um, if you apply this to real hardware, this is really purely random, uh, as random as it can be, um, at least with our current understanding of uh, um, quantum physics. Um, and that is um, useful in um, security uh, and so on. Um, the implementation of this uh, method is using the low-level APIs, as I said before. So in this implementation, we will use things like um, a program, like a step, Hadamar, which is uh, uh, one of the gates in quantum computing. So this is really doing the, the, the real quantum uh, work. It will do this in a quantum execution environment, which is uh, just an interface. Well, while I'm here, I can probably show this interface, which allows you to run a program. 
and a program is then a quantum program. Um, the simple quantum computing uh, execution interface that we're using here is simply using your local uh, uh, host. But um, the same application that you are using, uh, uh, that, that you're writing, can also use, for example, a cloud quantum computing execution environment. And it would be nice that in the future, when there's real quantum hardware, that um, you can keep your programs and you just change the uh, quantum execution environment to, to real uh, hardware or so. Um, that is not for tomorrow, um, but um, that doesn't matter too much uh, to you as a developer. I often compare it with the, um, the Y2K bug, the Millennium bug. We knew that um, at the year 2000 that some of the existing uh, computer software would stop working because of uh, uh, um, um, well issues with how the the, uh, the date was stored. And uh, it took a long time before all the software was updated and you didn't want to wait until it was really um, uh, 2000 before you started uh, working on it. So therefore, it's very useful to start working with simulators before um, uh, real quantum hardware is there because then by the time that quantum hardware is available, you will have your applications ready.